All right, hello everyone, and welcome to our second week in Biology One. I uh, hope you all had a great weekend. Um, and for this week, we're going to be looking at chapter two, uh, which is basically a chapter on chemistry. And we're gonna be looking at the parts of chemistry that's really essential for understanding biology and uh, studying biological systems. So if we look at a biological system and we break it down into its simplest components, and you remember the um, hierarchy of, of, of living things in uh, the natural environment, you remember that the, sim most, the simplest form of, of a living organism is the atom. And um, that atom, can be made up or an atom can be from many different elements. Okay? And an element is, is basically a substance that cannot be broken, broken down into any other substances by these chemical reactions. Okay? And so elements will make up all of the matter in the biological systems. And matter is basically anything that's taking up space and has mass. And whenever we refer to mass, we're just talking about the amount of material that's in an object. And so all of matter is composed up of those chemical elements and those atoms. And if we look at all of the natural, uh, naturally existing elements in the top portion of the periodic table here, uh, we'll see that there are uh, a list of, of many, many different elements. And each of these elements in the periodic table, so if we zoom in to one of these blocks, these elements, there is some information in this periodic table that we can take advantage of. And that information consists of uh, aspects such as the atomic number, the element symbol, and then the average mass. And so for example, here we're looking at, we're taking a look at carbon and the element symbol for carbon is a C and the atomic number for carbon is six. This is basically telling us that carbon has six protons and the atomic mass allows us to determine basically how many neutrons are present in that atom because the atomic mass is the mass of average atom of that element. And so for example, if the average mass is 12, then that means that there's six protons and six neutrons because the particles that have mass in an atom are the protons and the neutrons. The protons are the positively charged uh, uh, subatomic particles and the neutrons are the neutrally charged and um, those two elements or those two parts of an atom are found in the nucleus and they are what give the element its mass. The element will also have electrons in the electron orbitals that are surrounding that nucleus and um, they on average generally will equal the number of protons. Now, when you start talking about interactions and um, other factors uh, such as making ionic bonds and uh, covalent bonds and all of those other things, that can lead you to having different numbers of electrons or sharing of electrons differently, which can affect charges of, of atoms and molecules and all of those aspects. And so whenever we look at these elements, there are a couple things we, we really need to, to make note of. The first is that um, with this information, we can really determine uh, how many protons and electrons are, are in an element. Um, so six telling us protons and six telling us the number of electrons for carbon. So what that generally means, remember this is an on average basis because 
as we'll learn about in a little bit, uh, you can have isotopes of elements that causes the neutrons numbers to differ. And then whenever they start making bonds, you can lose electrons. And so your electron numbers will differ as well. But generally on average, you're going to have six protons and six uh, electrons for carbon. And if the atomic mass is 12, that means it has six neutrons. So for carbon 12, right, carbon 12, this is the case, six protons, six neutrons, and six electrons. And so if we uh, draw kind of the atom um, for that uh, element, for carbon, you're going to have, this is going to be a uh, crude drawing. So just kind of bear with me, four, five, six, those are your protons. Let's get a different color. So here are your neutrons. All right. And then our electrons. So these are the electron shells that I just drew those black rings. Now, for the first electron shell, it can hold a maximum of two electrons. So one, two. Now, we said that carbon has six electrons. Carbon-12 has six electrons. And, and so that means that the second orbital is going to have the remaining four. Okay, so we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. Now for the second orbital, and, and we're really going to only refer to atoms that have two or three electron orbitals, just to keep it simple. So for electron orbitals one, you have a maximum of two electrons. For orbital two and three, you have a maximum of eight. And this is referred to as the octet rule. And so this basically says that for orbital two, you only can have eight electrons and orbital three, you can have eight. So for example, sodium, I believe is 11, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, yeah, 11. Sodium is, is atomic number of 11. So that means its first orbital will have two and its second orbital will have eight. That's a total of 10 electrons. And the third orbital will have one. So it'll be two, eight, and one to make 11 electrons. And so for carbon, being that carbon is one of the most important atoms biologically because the um, organic molecules that we'll talk about in the next chapter are all carbon-based organic molecules. And so carbon is really interesting because it can bond or it can make up to four covalent bonds. And that's because stable atoms want for an atom to be stable it wants to have those outer electron orbitals filled so for example this carbon has four electrons in that outer orbital we said it can hold eight so that means it needs four more electrons in order to be filled and for that atom to be classified as being stable and so what that means is that you can see um, you know, carbon to make bonds again with up to four other atoms. And one example of this is methane, CH4. And notice here it has bonds with four hydrogen atoms. Okay. And what they're doing is carbon has those four electrons in its outer shell. Hydrogen has one electron in its outer shell. So that one electron is being shared in that outer shell. So now you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight electrons in carbon's outer shell. And since hydrogen only has one electron in its outer shell, it's sharing one of those, one of those four carbon electrons. So it has two. And so both of those atoms have a full outer orbital 
of, of two for hydrogen and eight for carbon. And so those atoms are stable. And that's what atoms strive to, to obtain is these, these stable, um, these stable orbitals. And so keep that in mind when we talk about the, the bonding, how, how bonds are formed. So like covalent bonds and ionic bonds, because this is, is really what's driving the amount of bonds that an, an atom can make. And so if we look at the elements that make up the body, uh, we already mentioned that carbon is a, a big element uh, that, that's found in, in, in living organisms. And so of the 92 naturally occurring elements, 25 are really essential for human beings to exist. Four of those 25 make up 90% of the body weight. Then you have other elements that are, are, are important, but they're only in small amounts. And so they're what we refer to as trace elements. And you can have elements to combine with one another to form compounds. So compounds are just two elements put together in fixed ratios. And if we look at the elements that are important for humans, we'll see that carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and um, oh man, I am blanking. Carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. There we go. Man, I'm brain's going out here. So oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen are the, the big four. They're the ones that make up 96% of your, your body weight. The other trace elements are uh, all of the elements that we have uh, listed here at the bottom. These are things like boron, chromium, magnesium, et cetera. And so this total list here is the 25 that we need to sustain human life. And like we already mentioned, when we talked about the periodic table, each element consists of one kind of atom and you can't break that element down into a more simpler form. And so that atom is the smallest unit of, of matter and the smallest unit of, of living organisms that still retains those properties of that associated element. And so when we look at the components that make up an atom, we've already went over this, uh, earlier, but we're just kind of putting it down in, in text here for you. Um, the atoms are composed of those subatomic particles, those three subatomic particles, the proton, the electron, and the neutron. We've already said that the proton and the neutrons are the one that has, are the particles that have a, a, a mass. The electrons, they have a discernible, uh, uh, you can't really discern the mass. So we essentially say they're mass of zero. And so the atomic mass of an atom is determined by the number of protons and neutrons, but the charge of an atom is determined by the number of protons and electrons. And so protons are positively charged, electrons are negatively charged, and then your neutrons are, are um, they have a neutral charge. So here's an example of uh, helium. So it has an atomic number of, of two. So that means it has two protons, which are shown here as green, two neutrons, which are shown as blue, I mean, uh, brown, and then two electrons shown as yellow. And then this first electron cloud, this electron orbital holding those two electrons. So the atomic mass is four because you have one, two, three, four, four particles that have a mass of one. So that adds up to four. But then the, the charge of this atom is zero. It's neutral charge because it has two positive uh, particles and two negative particles. Each of those cancel out. If you had one more electron than protons, then it would be negative. If you had one, uh, more, uh, one less electron than protons, then it would be a positive ion. And we'll talk about those in a little bit. And so each atom of a particular element has its own unique atomic number. And that number uh, is associated with the unique number of protons that that atom has. Now, remember when I was talking about the periodic table, I said that this, 
number of neutrons and electrons was on average because especially with or so specifically with neutrons the atoms can have more neutrons uh, leading to isotopes and that can also cause that mass number to differ as well so an atom's mass number is always the sum of the protons and the neutrons that you have in that nucleus but again you can have variations of that uh, that differ from the number of protons, neutrons differ from the number of protons, and that leads to isotopes. So isotopes have the same number of protons, and they behave the same way in chemical reactions, they just have the different number of neutrons. So for example, carbon-12 is a carbon atom that has six protons, six neutrons. So it has an atomic mass of 12. However, you also have carbon-13 and carbon-14, which have differing numbers of neutrons. So this carbon atom has six protons, but seven neutrons. And this carbon atom has six protons and eight neutrons. So those additions of those neutrons make those atoms heavier. So they diffuse a little bit slower in, in certain reactions and stuff in, in the body. Um, and so these are the isotopes of, of carbon, okay? On average, your carbon-12 is going to be much more abundant in the natural environment, whereas 13 and 14 is a little bit more rare. And that's why you also see the mass of uh, the atomic mass of an element have a decimal behind it. Because if you have carbon 12, 13, and 14, on average, most of the carbons are going to be 12, but then you're gonna have a couple carbon atoms that are, are bigger than 12. So that's why you have a number that's slightly larger than 12 for that average atomic mass, because those isotopes do exist. And then um, whenever we're, we're looking at uh, chemical reactions and how chemical reactions happen, the electrons are what's involved in, in those chemical reactions. So the number of electrons actually determine the chemical properties of that atom. And the reactions enable the atoms to either share electrons or to donate electrons to other atoms to transfer those electrons. And then those um, interactions of, of other atoms with electrons from another atom actually leads to the development of, of chemical bonds. So if we look at the different types of chemical bonds that exist, um, one of those is known as ionic bonds. So when an atom loses or gains electrons, it becomes electrically charged. And remember we said if the electrons are more than the protons, it's negative. If it, the number of electrons is less than the number of protons, then that atom is, is it's positive. Um, and that leads to the formation of ions, okay? And so if you have ions of opposite um, charges, then they will attract one another and form an ionic bond. So for example, a compound like table salt, which has a positive sodium atom and a negative chlorine atom, those positive and negative atoms will attract with one another and that makes uh, table salt. So here we have a little video uh, just kind of um, going through that process. Let me actually make sure I share my sound. happens between sodium and chlorine atoms. An electron moves from the sodium atom to the chlorine atom. The outer shells of both atoms are now complete, containing eight electrons. The chlorine atom now has 18 electrons, but only 17 protons. Because an electron has a negative charge, the chlorine atom now has a net negative charge. Such a charged atom or molecule is called an ion in this case, a negative ion. The sodium atom has lost an electron, leaving it with an extra proton, which has a positive charge. The sodium atom has become a positive ion. 
Ions with opposite charges are attracted to each other, forming an ionic bond. These ions combine to form a compound with new properties. In this case, sodium chloride, ordinary table salt, is formed. Okay, and so in this example, we have this interaction where sodium ion has one more electron in, or it has one electron in its outermost shell. And so the easiest way for that atom to become stable is to just get rid of that electron because then this outer shell has eight electrons inside. Chlorine is opposite. It only needs one more uh, electron to get eight in its, in its outer shell. And so what happens is sodium will give that electron to chlorine therefore making sodium positively charged because it will have one less electron than it started with. Chlorine will become negatively charged because it will have one more electron than it started with. And so you end up with this, uh, these two ions here. So a sodium ion and a chloride ion. So these two will be attracted to one another through those uh, positive and negative attraction forces and then it will lead to an ionic bond forming the compound sodium chloride or table salt. Second type of, of bonding is a covalent bond. And this actually forms when you have two atoms to share one or more pairs of electrons. Covalent bonds are the strongest of the bonds that we'll talk about and they hold the atoms together in the form of a molecule. So like a molecule of water or uh, H2 or O2. Um, those are examples of, of molecules that have been formed through covalent bonds. And this video here uh, shows how that, that works as well. A covalent bond is the sharing of a pair of outer shell electrons by two atoms. For example, each of these hydrogen atoms has one electron in its outer shell, but needs two electrons to complete its outer shell. If the two hydrogen atoms share electrons, they can both complete their outer shells. The shared pair of electrons constitutes a covalent bond, shown in shorthand as a line. The covalently bonded hydrogen atoms form a molecule of hydrogen gas. A molecule is defined as two or more atoms held together by covalent bonds. An oxygen atom needs two electrons to complete its outer shell. Two oxygen atoms can share two pairs of electrons. A molecule of oxygen gas is held together by a double covalent bond, two shared pairs of electrons. A carbon atom needs four electrons to complete its outer shell. It can share electrons with four hydrogen atoms, forming a methane molecule containing four single covalent bonds. Methane is a compound, a substance formed by the combination of two or more elements. We call methane natural gas. It is the fuel burned in gas stoves and furnaces. An oxygen atom needs two additional electrons to fill its outer shell. Thus, it can form two single covalent bonds. An oxygen atom can share electrons with two hydrogen atoms, forming a molecule of water containing two single covalent bonds. Okay. And so, um, one thing that was, was mentioned in that video is also how um, the ways that you can, or, or basically how you can represent a molecule. So for example, they said that the covalent bond for H2 was represented by drawing a uh, line between the two um, uh, atomic symbols. And so what you can have then is you can have a structural formula to represent a molecule, which is shown here, where we're showing that this carbon atom that needs four electrons to fill its outer shell can uh, fill that in various different ways. We showed methane where it would um, have four single hydrogen bonds, whereas uh, is which is one way for it to happen. But here we have a carbon 
binding with two hydrogens where it's sharing um, uh, electrons. So that's two single bonds. And then the other two electrons come from a double bond with oxygen. And this would be the structural formula for formaldehyde. Here you can show this formula in a different way, which is the electron configuration where you're actually showing that shared electron uh, structure. Um, another way we can show this uh, same structural formula is through what we call a space filling model, where we just show the atoms color coded based off of what element they represent uh, as balls. And so here we have the red being oxygen, the black being carbon, and then the white being hydrogen. Um, or you can just do a ball and stick model where you still have the same color coded balls, but now you're just putting a, a stick or a, a bar in between those to represent where those covalent bonds exist. And so we mentioned in the video or that video uh, we just showed that a molecule of water uh, is made up when you have an oxygen having two covalent bonds with two um, hydrogen atoms. And what happens with that molecule is the electrons are not shared equally uh, in the regions or the electron space around those, those atoms. The electrons actually spend more time around the oxygen uh, atom than they do the two hydrogen atoms. And so what that does is it leads to what we call a polar molecule, one that has this uneven distribution of charge. And so there is this partial polarity that exists within that hydrogen molecule that can cause it to form some, some bonds between other um, partially charged or other charged uh, molecules and ions. The partial polarity of water allows for other water molecules to uh, share a bond, a chemical bond between one another that is called hydrogen bonds. And this is uh, formed through weak electrical attractions that come from the partial polarity of each individual water molecule. So for example, we said that oxygen has more, the electrons around it more often than the hydrogen atoms. So that means that each hydrogen atom is going to have a partial positive charge. Each oxygen atom is going to have a partial negative charge. So then, this water molecule can then um, share a hydrogen bond with an adjacent water molecule because they will orient themselves to where the negative portion of a water molecule will interact with the positive portion of an adjacent water molecule. For example, the hydrogens bonding with the oxygens we see here and here and then the oxygens orient in itself to bind with the hydrogens of adjacent water molecules. And so this is referred to as a hydrogen bond because hydrogens are involved in that chemical bonding process. And remember, it's, it's all based off of the fact that there are these partial polarities that exist in those water molecules. So here's another little video just to kind of show that example. The atoms that make up a water molecule are in a constant tug of war over their shared electrons. Oxygen exerts a far stronger pull on the shared electrons than does hydrogen, and so the electrons spend more of their time closer to the oxygen atom. Because of this unequal sharing of electrons, the oxygen atom in a water molecule actually has a slight negative charge, and each hydrogen atom has a slight positive charge, even though the water molecule as a whole is neutral. Because of the unequal sharing of electrons and the resulting positive and negative poles, a water molecule is said to be polar. The polarity of water molecules causes them to be attracted to each other. Since the positively charged atom involved in this special type of attraction is always a hydrogen atom, this kind of bond between molecules is called a hydrogen bond. Each water molecule can hydrogen bond to four other water molecules.
A hydrogen bond is weak and lasts only a tiny fraction of a second, but it takes a lot of energy to overcome the combined attraction of many hydrogen bonds. This explains water's great capacity to store heat, its high boiling point, surface tension, and several other unusual properties. Okay, and, and that's actually a really good point to, to, to kind of jump into because as we go into the second section of, of chapter two, we're going to explore all of those properties of water and talk about them in, in much more detail. Um, and so before that, let's just take time to kind of review. So if we have a lithium ion, which is Li plus, so positive, joins a bromide ion, Br negative, so it's negative, to form lithium bromide, the resulting bond is a blank bond. So just take a second, think about that, pause video. All right, so you should have got ionic bond, and it's an ionic bond because the uh, lithium is donating an electron to the bromide, and you have positive and negative atoms um, being attracted to one another. Those ions are being attracted to one another, forming that ionic bond. Okay, one other thing we want we start talking about water is that Cells are constantly uh, rearranging molecules. They're building molecules, breaking them down, and and using them for lots of different uh, lots of different things in those cellular processes, lots of different functions. So the changes in those molecules and the chemical composition of those molecules are referred to as chemical reactions. Those reactions can have reactants, which are the starting products, uh, and um, they can, or, or the starting uh, components, the starting materials, and then the products, which are the end materials. So for example, one of the more common um, reactions you're probably familiar with is photosynthesis. So you have um, carbon dioxide and water and sunlight, and that produce, that's the reaction, the reactants. Those reactants produce uh, glucose and oxygen, which are the products. And what's important with, with chemical reactions is that they can rearrange, they can rearrange, cannot talk, they can rearrange matter, but they cannot make new matter or destroy new matter. They only rearrange it. Um, and so that's very important in, in terms of, of chemical reactions and understanding those. And so that's it for uh, section one in chapter two. Um, whenever you move on to uh, chapter or section two of chapter two, uh, in the next part of the module, we'll pick up and continue with the importance of water and life. See you then.